We are I. I have this weird relationship with these wearable fitness trackers. I've worn one for, oh my gosh, probably almost 15 years now. I think the first one I ever wore was a blue and black Nike Plus. You know, and this is back when you had that little chip in your shoe and it communicated with your watch. I don't even remember if there was an app that was attached to it or if you had to go to a website to be able to download the information off the watch and upload it to the website. I I can't even remember, you know, and then it's gone through like the Fitbits and, you know, this, that, and the next thing, the Polar devices. And I have this Suunto watch now. And I actually do think these things are pretty much useless for the most part. And the only real reason why that I wanted to get mine is because it – and I don't know how accurate this is because I've never actually tested it, but it detects barometric pressure. So barometric pressure is just the, the changes in atmospheric pressure, which tells you whether it's going to be nice or whether or not it's going to storm. Really, that's is the simple version of explaining this, which is incredibly useful to me in the backcountry because just because you look at, you know, what's supposed to happen weather-wise when you are on mountaintops, deep in valleys, deep in the backcountry, you know, the weather changes consistently all the time and can be, can, can be completely opposite of a, a weather report and things can sporadically happen. So if you can, if you can track that, it's to your advantage, which is great because these are some of the things they need. It also, you know, has the breadcrumbing feature, which, you know, is great for not getting lost in the backcountry because I do a lot of off trail stuff, you know, and also great that you can upload this to a three dimensional map. So, you know, when you go off trail or even if you are on trail afterwards, when you get back home, you can see this three dimensional layout of where you were in relationship to these, you know, mountain peaks, these valleys, these slopes and these meadows and all this kind of stuff. But the one thing that I do know when it comes to like the actual tracking outside of the pedometer, outside of the steps that you are taking, is that when I'm running on the treadmill in the morning and it says that my heart rate is, you know, like 195 to 205, somewhere around in that range. And that's really where it says that I'm consistently at when I'm running on the treadmill. Now, when I'm actually running, it doesn't feel, well, I consider it to be jog. Incline two, speed seven is more of a jog to me. It's not quite a run yet. But it doesn't seem that hard, and it definitely doesn't seem like my heart is pumping that hard. So I don't necessarily believe that my heart rate is that high because I wouldn't be able to sustain that. And I can sustain that for a mile, two miles, three miles, four miles, five miles, really till I just get bored of running and I don't want to do it anymore. Which that doesn't seem like a heart rate that's 195 to 205 the entire time. Like that's where it levels out at. And it just stays there the entire time. Great for the number of calories that it says that you burn. But again, I don't believe that it's that high. If I had to venture a guess, I would have to say that it's a lot lower down in like maybe the 170, 180 range. Now, arguably, I'm probably going to burn roughly about the same amount of calories. However, my VO2 max isn't really going to change. My, my actual fitness level isn't going to change that much. It's really just going to stay efficient where it's at. But then also, if I... When you're running, when anybody's running or jogging, you naturally are going to run with your arms that help propel you forward. This is a part of our physiology that just happens when you run. You know, it's really difficult and looks dumb as hell to run with your arms down by your side. But if you did do that, your heart rate would plummet. It'd be nowhere near the same. 
And then when I'm actually doing something where my heart rate gets very high, where my wrist happens to be below my heart or roughly thereof. So take, for example, when I'm rowing, like I'm rowing and this is where I know now my heart rate is up around maybe that 190 range, 180 to 190, 185, because it's arduous for me to breathe. I can't carry on a conversation. I have to stay very focused in what I want to do. I know I'm pushing myself. I know my heart rate is is way up. I feel it. I can feel it in my throat. You know, I I know my heart rate is high, which is not the feeling that I get when I'm running on the treadmill, although it says that my heart rate is very high. This is the same feeling that I get on the assault bike, you know, that I'm exhausted, I'm panting, I'm dying for breath, I'm wanting to take a break after a very short period of time because it feels like my heart rate is very, very high. But on the watch, it's very, very low. Now, the part of this that is challenging to me is because it's not about the calories. I don't give a shit about the calories because I work out it. I know during a workout, my average workout, even though I push myself very hard, I've committed in my mind that I'm going to burn probably on the short end 400 calories, maybe on the high end 500. Now, it's going to be a sliding scale in there somewhere I fully understand because I don't think anything really tracks it good enough to be able to fully understand exactly how many calories you're burning. But the important part to me is, is whether or not I'm improving my fitness, whether or not I'm maintaining my fitness or losing my fitness. This is the important part to me because this is correlated to how hard you work and is not necessarily correlated to time. So you can have an abundant amount of time at a very low fitness level that is not going to improve your fitness level. Things like short burst, high intensity are things that are going to improve your fitness level that don't have to necessarily be done for an extended period of time. This is the concept behind, you know, high interval training. You know, something that really tests the epoch theory, you know, about post-workout oxygen consumption. So, you know, like when we, when we look at this factor, because this is also correlated into the amount of you know, recovery time or downtime I should have in between my fitness belts. Well, how can I accurately calculate that? This is why I completely disregard this where it tells me I need like 48 hours of recovery time. Well, what is that also based on? Is it based on people like me who, you know, ice bath and sauna and, you know, eat healthy, you know, do all the things, stay active, stay, stay healthy mentally, emotionally, and physically. Is it, is it based on that? Because the one thing that I do know, you know, maybe some of the newer versions do, but the one thing that I know is that my Sunto watch has no software in it to be able to calculate things you've done for recovery. And this is why I always label the ice bath and the sauna is stretching because stretching is probably the, the closest thing that you can get to like maybe a recovery calculating function, which should be incredibly important in all this software that if you are going to push yourself that you've done things to be able to, to counter the, um, the fitness that you've done from a recovery standpoint, because if I always just add the stretching or say I focused on that, it would technically calculate them losing fitness if I just prioritized that, you know, but if I add a category of ice bath or sauna and it calculates the actual advantages to recovery into my overall fitness, now that would be useful. That'd be incredibly useful. You know, and maybe some of these technologies do, like I just... I have the Sunto watch. It was so expensive and all these really good air quotes, good uh, wearable technologies are very expensive. And even for this thing, the ironic part that I get it for the back country because it tells the temperature, the barometric pressure, the breadcrumbing and all that kind of stuff that if you are in the back country using these functions, like this watch, the battery on it actually doesn't even last more than about six or eight hours, which is terrible because 
if you're out in the backcountry, it just goes to show like you're not going to be far enough into the backcountry to really get lost or anything if you if the watch battery only lasts six or eight hours. Like I go into the backcountry where I'm in in for like 12 hours or 14 hours or days. Well, I need it to last that long because I need to understand how to be able to to get out. And it doesn't. It doesn't have an ongoing function through charging as well. So it's not like I could keep up the the GPS and the breadcrumbing feature through charging it again on an external charging, you know, apparatus. So what's the use of the breadcrumbing feature if it only can get me back to that point? And I can't historically go back into it and follow that same breadcrumb trail out. It has to be in real time while that function is on. So it, it renders itself useless as well. And again, hardware wise, you know, like this is about three years old, but software, they can update that anytime. So if they were focused on those things, then, you know, great, they could change it. And it can't change battery life, obviously, but this is kind of some of the shortfalls in especially this Sunto device, but a lot of these things that I, I deem to kind of be important that I want to track. So I guess what this really all boils down to, to me is the, the number one thing that I really enjoy this for is what I just got is how many activities you do monthly quarterly and annually just making sure that you're kind of doing enough and that's what i enjoy like how am i consistent year after year well the one thing i know is in 2021 i hiked a lot i hiked a lot during like the height of covid especially in the summertime so you know my activities were very high but you know my 2022 compares to my 2020 is very much the same so okay, this is this is my average activity. I played a lot of squash in 2020. Did not play a lot of squash in 2022, although it looks like that I supplemented that activity for something else. So that allows me to be able to understand this is my kind of baseline activity in the year. The number of times I do something is prioritizing my fitness, whether it's recovery or whether or not it's improving my fitness or maintaining my fitness. So this is the this is to me the only really actual tangible metric that I can use to make sure that I'm consistent if all other the the details and the stats fail. So um I don't really know where I'm going with this podcast, but more thinking out loud because I've just got these reports and I was kind of looking at them and and but if you have any suggestions or if I if I'm not if I don't know of a wearable technology that tracks your fitness that kind of you know helps conquer some of these shortfalls that the student has, you know, reach out, DM me, let me know, send me an email, let me know because you know I think that I might need to make a little bit of a, a trade here to be able to calculate what I'm looking at a little bit, a uh, little bit better, a little bit more efficiently and a little bit more accurately. So um, 2023 going to be a great year. Hopefully it's going to be a great year for you too. And if anything else, just add one thing to your life that you think is going to help you on the back end. So that when you're 70, 80, 90 years old, that you're just making it a little bit easy on yourself. Because that's the reason why I do what I do every day. 